Hey, greetings to all our Accra community. It is my honor to introduce to you today our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Totaleni Asino. He is an associate professor of educational technology and director of the Emerging Technology and Creativity Research Lab in the College of Education and Human Sciences at Oklahoma State University in the United States. I met Dr. Asino during the SAGE, that's uh, method space. It's one, uh, I believe like one branch of the SAGE publications. And uh, what we did together was uh, we, uh, were part of the conversation. It was a panel discussion on research and culture. And as I listened to him, I thought immediately, I thought I should invite Dr. Asino to the Accra Colloquium. And we are happy that in spite of the difference in the time, you see, uh, what time is it there, Dr. Totalini? about uh, five, I mean, uh, four in the morning. Can you imagine that? And uh, in spite of this difference in time, the sacrifice he's making, he uh, agreed to be part of uh, this very important event. Uh, reflexivity, while I listened to him talk in very, uh, a uh, clear way about knowing oneself as a researcher and how important that is when we do our research. I said, we need this topic. We need to understand more. And so here we are uh, to our dear Accra community. We are bringing to you uh, Dr. Totalini Asino, and he will present his topic on knowing ourselves as a way of understanding others. And uh, this is and the, the important role that reflexivity plays in qualitative research. So uh, welcome everyone. And let us now give our full attention to the presentation of Dr. Asino. Yes, please, uh, Dr. Asino, this is now your time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aseli, and uh, good to, to share space with you again. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, uh, you have, I am aware that we all have choices we make with our times, um, and you're choosing to be here. So uh, I am honored and blessed by your presence. Um, and I appreciate you all being here, and I'm really thankful for the invitation to engage in this conversation um, uh, that I'm passionate about when it comes to research, especially qualitative research. Um, so I'm going, I have a few slides that, um, that I'm going to be sharing, but I'll, I'll go through them relatively fast because what I'm really interested in is, is a conversation. Um, I prefer to have conversations rather than lectures and and uh, and talk to people. So I'm going to just share my um, perspectives on reflexivity, um, and then we will um, uh, we will hopefully have uh, um, uh, plenty of time for conversation. So uh, let me start off by um, sharing my screen. Um, I tested this out earlier with Dr. David, so hopefully I won't embarrass him by messing up how I'm going to figure this out. So let's just quickly uh, see if I can do this. Um, all right, we'll move this. All right, is that coming out clear? Yes, uh, very clear. Okay. Fantastic. Well, um, again, um, the, the title of my talk here is Knowing uh, Self to Understand Others and the Essential Role of Reflexivity. Uh, whenever I think about that, I'm reminded of, a, of, an, of an old quote um, that uh, we have all probably used in, in one way or another, uh, know thine self and to thine self be true. Um, I really think that when 
there's a um it's important to be truthful in research now i know that seems blatant um and uh um but sometimes it's I, I think it's important for us to remember that um we have been entrusted uh with such a precious um duty as researcher uh, which is to be able to not just generate and create knowledge, but also to share the experiences of others. Uh, and I think we can only do that if we are uh, honest with ourselves um, in, in how we're engaging it. So let me start off with where I want to end up. Uh, this is what I want the takeaway to be for, for, for my presentation. Um, and it really says that if we agree that in qualitative research, the researcher is the instrument, then if we're not aware of who we are, if we're not being truthful to ourselves, and if we're not being reflective, that for me is like um, what in quantitative uh, research is using an invalidated instrument. So um, that for me is sort of where I really want the big takeaway to be. Um, but before I get to that, let's just give a quick layout of what um, I'm hoping to do um through this presentation and i want to share a little bit about who i am and how i'm coming to this conversation and how i got here i'll share a little bit about the work that i do and then end into a uh, lead into the conversation on, on on reflexivity um i think knowing where a person comes from knowing who a person is helps us understand and contextualize what they are talking about and how they are approaching the research so I situate myself in this way. I am a Namibian. That's where I was. Um, I was born. Uh, Namibia, if you are not aware, is in the southwest part uh, of, um, of 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 Africa. Um, that's where I trace my roots from. That's where I was raised. Even though I'm currently living and working in the um, in the U.S., uh, I do uh, international work research um, because my work often relate to international education and comparative studies. And these are the areas in which I find myself usually doing, um, doing my work where I have my research partners and so forth. Academically, uh, this is my training. Uh, I started off with um, a Bachelor of Media Studies and Political Science at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh in the US. And then there I also uh, studied for a multimedia technologies masters as well as corporate communications. I then moved over to Cabrini College in Philadelphia in the US where I was working in student affairs. And while there studied for instructional systems and technology. Um, at at uh, Penn State University, I went uh, for my doctorate, and there I did a dual um, PhD in learning design and technology and comparative international education. Uh, I'm currently at uh, Oklahoma State University in our program that used to be called the Educational Technology Program, but now it's changed to learning design and technology. Um, so I share that so you can sort of see where I have come from and where I am now and how I got to where I am so you can contextualize uh, my conversations. These are the things that I think about. In other words, this is what my research agenda really looks like. I'm much more passionate about the adoption and use of emerging technologies. Um, I do my work usually in comparative uh, studies. So I use comparative uh, uh, methods in my research. Um, most of my research really focuses on mobile learning and the design of mobile devices, uh, work around indigenous knowledge, diffusion of innovation. I'm passionate about open education, open access, but mostly what I try to, to, to think about and what I try to do in my work is explore how culture, agency, and representation manifest themselves um, in different contexts and that interplay in the development and evaluation of learning technologies across learning contexts. So I know that is a bit of a mouthful, but I'm just giving you a bit of a, of, of a background in terms of who I am and what I think about. Um, these are my perspectives on learning. I believe that learning is a partnership. It's a partnership between the learner, uh, the, the, the teacher and the environment. 
I think who the learner is and who the environment or what the environment is can change from time to time. But I really think that it's, it's an interaction between those three elements. Um, I think, of course, learning is socially constructed. Um, and, and in that belief is, is, uh, is anchoring the idea that culture is really important in the learning processes. Um, and knowledge today is distributed around the world and we have to find a way to be able to tap into, into those because there's no one community that is the keeper of all knowledges. And because my work tend to focus much more on technology, I do believe that technology is a tool, but also because technology is such a crucial part of who we are and what we do these days, it's not just a tool that you can dismiss, it's a significant uh, a, a part of our of our lived experience in our in our, in our everyday. I consider myself uh, a comparativist, uh, which basically means that I'm I'm much more interested in how phenomenon manifest themselves across varied contexts, comparing those and see what we can learn from that. So this is why that um, I'm much more passionate about questions of the why and how those really excite me. And I tend to be drawn much more towards qualitative uh, uh, research method because I'm really excited about the complexity of the human experiences. Um, so that's a quick uh, wrap up of who I am and how I come to this, uh, to this conversation. But let's move on into um, reflexivity. I'm not going to really go deep into um, what it is because I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that we have uh, um, a bit of an understanding on that. Um, so I'm just going to put up a few quotes here and there to be able to, uh, to guide the conversation. Reflexivity is important in our work as qualitative researcher because qualitative research is contextual, right? Um, it occurs in a specific time, in a specific place uh, between um, involving people. Um, so it's really important that we describe all of these contexts and all of these intersecting um, relationship. In so doing, we help um, the reader to be able to assess and evaluate our research and make sense uh, and make sense of that. Right. But if you really think about it, this idea of reflexivity has been around for a really long time. Right, um, and I love this uh, um, this quote uh, from Salzman, who basically say that um, in qualitative research, and he was really more talking about, um, rather Salzman was really more talking about uh, from a perspective as an anthropologist. There is no idea that has been so wholeheartedly uh, accepted and adopted as this idea of reflexivity. We all agree that it's a good thing, um, and no one really questions that. Um, but I think it's also important for us to be able to question about uh, what exactly is reflexivity? Do we all know how to do it? Is it always uh, a good thing? Does it always lead to, um, to positive results? Uh, I think it does, but I think it's something that we are also important to question. So I love this, um, uh, uh, this quote that if, if reflexivity was an object, it would be a mirror, because I think really that's what happens when you're reflecting, when you're engaging in, in, in reflexivity, you're putting up a mirror and being able to not just see yourself, but being able to be upfront about who you are and how who you are influences the work that you're doing. Um, I think that's really uh, the biggest important thing here. Um, I think the researchers should be able to reflect on their own identity and the role that identity plays in the work that they are doing and in the society in which they are living in. I think that's really what the, um, the biggest uh, um, uh, takeaway here is when it comes to reflexivity. So let me give an example of that as it comes to, to my own experience, right? When I'm doing my research, and when I'm talking to you about the research that I'm doing, this is what I want you to know about me. This is who I am. I am a man from the Owambo group, which uh, is located in the northern part of Namibia, right? It's 
That's important to know in my research, especially if I'm doing research studies in the country because my ethnic group is the largest in the country. So within that comes issues embedded of power and privilege that comes with who I am when I'm in that context. But when I'm outside of that context, especially when I'm outside of Namibia, I also have the identity of being a Namibian. And I'm also an African who's often working in a country or rather in the world that doesn't really always value um, what I have to say because of who I am or where I'm from. A lot of people often do not value perspectives from African researchers because they tend to think that they're already um, behind or so forth. Um, and sometimes that's not just limited to um, African researchers, but also limited, also applies to researchers from either the global south, the developing world, or whatever label you want to give it to them, right? I'm also a Black man living in the U.S., and that has certain connotation as part of that identity, right? Um, it, it has, at, at the same time, I also am educated. I have two PhDs, three masters, and double majored in my bachelor's. So that identity also give me certain access, certain privileges uh, as well in when I'm doing my work. I'm also a university professor, and that again has something that is embedded within that identity. All of these things and all of these uh, uh, markers come together to make up who I am and how I apply um, the research. So when we talk about being reflective, what are we really talking about? I think there's um, maybe three things that we need to talk about because they're also the thing that can hold us back in our research. So we need to be reflexive about the methods that we are using, right? What are we understanding of those methods? And what are some implicit uh, um, connotations that are embedded within that? We have a discipline that we're coming from and we need to be able to say, okay, I'm coming through this, like I said, for my work, I'm coming through to this through a lens of being a comparativist researcher. That means something. So I have to, to reflect on that and I have to share that with you so that you can uh, understand where I'm coming from. But we also all hold epistemological assumptions that we need to be able to say, okay, this is how I view the world. This is what I think the nature of knowledge is. And that impacts who I am and how I actually understand what is happening uh, all around me. All of that is important when we come to this. We have to ask ourselves, especially, can we be objective? Can you be objective given who you are? Now, one of the things that I think is fun about qualitative research is that it's okay to own your subjectivity, right? Uh, I always find it amusing when people in quantitative research tend to think that somehow their work is more objective. I don't think that is the case because it's still the human being who's designing that instrument in even in the quantitative research. But here's what I wanna take away from this slide about objectivity and subjectivity. Now, let us assume that you are a person who is racist, who automatically believes that because of the race that you are, other people, you are better than everybody else. Let's say that perhaps you're a person who has who harbors sexist tendencies. And you think that because you're a man, you're automatically superior to, um, to, 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 to a woman, right? Let's say that you're very, very nationalist and you think that your country is the only country and the best in the whole world and everybody else comes second uh, um, after you, right? All of those identities do not leave you when you do your research. They are part of who you are, right? So, and you need to be able to own that. And uh, one of the things that I shared in, um, in our conversation that uh, in the webinar that, uh, that we had uh, a while back, I said that if you are a person who crosses the street 
when you see a black person walking towards you because you're afraid of them, right? Or if you are the person who thinks, um, you know, somebody else uh, of its opposite gender is dumb just because they have a, a different gender from you, can you really fairly do research that involve both gender if you automatically have uh, um, an assumption that you believe that uh, you are better because of who you are, right? Um, I think we have to examine and explore all of these multiplicity and all these intersecting identities that make up who we are and how those influence the research that we conduct. So I think being reflective, uh, and when we talk about reflexivity, I think it's also really important for us to be able to say, okay, what exactly, who am I? What is my positionality? How does that influence the work that I do? How does that influence the questions that I ask? And how does that also influence the, uh, the research that I produce? So there are many different ways um, that you can do this. I think you have to always be able to disclose how are you coming to a topic? How are you coming to this conversation? Where are you coming from? What are some of the biases that you hold? Uh, what led you to this topic? Are the, do you have a history with this topic? Will, you, will your research maybe suffer from all of these self-serving biases? We need to be able to be upfront about that. I think we all have our biases, um, but I think if we own up to them and we share those in our own research, it helps at least the reader being able to make sense uh, uh, of, of, of the work that, uh, that we're doing there, right? So uh, where is the power held in relation to my research project? All these issues of power, all these issues of um, of, of perspective, all of these really do end up influencing uh, the work that we do and the research that we're engaging in. So again, I know that I went through this relatively fast, but what I really want to have here is for us to have more conversation about uh, reflexivity rather than me lecturing. Again, I come back to this slide here. If we all agree that in qualitative research, the researcher is the instrument, then it is important for us to know who that instrument is, right? It's important for us to be aware of who we are um, so that we can share more about that instrument. If we agree that in qualitative research, the researcher is the instrument, then not being aware of oneself, not being reflective is for me similar to using an invalid instrument. And when you have an invalid instrument, you're not going to be able to get uh, reliable data um, as you're collecting your data. So I know that in qualitative research, we don't put it in those type of terms, but I think for me, that's how I make sense of this. I think it's really important for us to be aware of ourselves um, so we can get to know who the other people the other people are. If you don't know who you are, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to know the other people. You're not going to be aware of how your worldview is coloring the data that you're collecting. Um, so here again, the emphasis is if we agree that qualitative research the researcher is the instrument, then we must be aware of ourselves um, if we are to collect reliable um, uh, data and generate research that is going to uh, inform and influence uh, our world. So I'm going to stop here and hopefully we can engage in a little bit more of a conversation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Pavel, we will now have the question and answer. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sina, for raising this topic. Uh, this is uh, um, highly important, I believe, as you already said, that uh, um, lacking uh, or not understanding well the 
idea of reflexivity uh, means that uh, the instrument is invalid. That I think uh, is a profound statement. Um, <clears throat> we have few questions already. Um, maybe before I go to the questions, um, I was thinking myself <laughs> when I was listening to your presentation, um, how deep um, should we reflect on ourselves? Sometimes it just uh, comes down to okay, mentioning who you are, I mean, in, in terms of engagement, uh, professional interest, uh, maybe some skills, some uh, other experience, but how deep should we go in terms of our own philosophy, <clears throat> our world, world view? Um, yeah, to what extent can we uh, reflect uh, ourselves, uh, you know, more objectively and more, um, I should say, um, like uh, more professionally? Um, it's a really good question, and it's a difficult one. Um, and my favorite word, my my favorite word in uh, since I was a PhD student is, um, or at least no, it was frustrating when I was a PhD student. But now I think I like it more as a professor. And the the word is it depends, right? That's that's the answer to to most of the question when we come to research. But let me give maybe let me answer your question by an example. Um, if I am doing research on um, the best uh, cake, right? Uh, I always tell people that if you are talking to me around a meal time because it's getting to breakfast, you're gonna get food food examples. So it's around dinner for you people for for those who are in uh, in the Philippines, and it's about breakfast for me. So I'm gonna use an example of food. If if I'm doing a research around um, the best cake, the best breakfast and so forth. Um, it doesn't really do my results a favor if I share with you about how tall I am, about maybe my certain worldview and so forth, because that's not contextual, that's not important to the research. But if I write up my results, and I tell you that the worst egg omelet that I tasted is the one that had broccoli in it. But I didn't tell you at the beginning that I hate broccoli and I think it's the worst vegetable in the world. Then I'm not really being honest and transparent. I have to declare that first so that when I give you this example, you'll be able to say, well, okay, I'm not gonna dismiss his opinion, but at least I should understand that, um, that, that, that he has this position towards broccoli, which is not exactly the, the, the right thing. Um, now, if I am, um, and then it, 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 it goes further depending on the research that you're, you're studying because your belief about knowledge, the nature of knowledge, your belief about um, uh, the nature of existence, right? Um, is important to a research project that you're doing, depending on what that research project is. But I think overall, really, I think it's really important for us to, um, I think every researcher must do this. Every researcher, regardless of whether you're quantitative or qualitative researcher, you should write your own positionality statement and just keep it. Even if you keep it on your computer or someone that just says, this is who I am. This is how I see the world. This is what I believe in, right? And I think you can, um, if, you, if we engage in that exercise, it kind of help us to sort of contextualize and, 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 and make sense of, 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 of what we're doing. Um, often we think of this as doing it for somebody else. I don't think it's for somebody else. I think it's really for us to be able to just even understand ourselves and how we see the world. So sometimes I think you have to really, I think it's always important to dig deep and know yourself and how that self impacts what you do. 
but I don't necessarily think that you have to always share it in every research product because some, some are not, uh, do not call for that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asim. Well, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay. My question, uh, Dr. Totalini, is that why is it uh, difficult for novice researchers to engage in this exercise of mm -hmm. knowing oneself and acknowledging that this is a challenge for novice researchers, what can research professors or uh, thesis and dissertation advisors do so that the, so they can facilitate the process of knowing oneself? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I think for novice researchers, it's difficult because sometimes I think we who teach are not very good at teaching it. Um, and what I mean by that is it's not really easy. So um, one of my uh, professors had said um, that the longest journey that you can take is a lot is a journey between you and yourself, right? Um, that is the longest journey you can take because it's it's a it's a it's it's a way you have to understand yourself. You have to know yourself, and if you don't know how to do that, it's going to be very difficult to teach somebody else ab about it. So I think that's one part. The other part is, for the most part. And I and I see this with my with my students, especially when they are doing their dissertation. If you think of a traditional dissertation or thesis as having maybe four chap four or five chapters, where the first chapter you're establishing the problem, the second you're um, showing the literature that supports the problem, the third you're giving the methods that you're going to be using in your research, and it's the fourth chapter where you're actually presenting your data and the five where you're discussing. So if, you, if we adopt that, that, um, that, uh, that format, from, from chapter one to chapter three, we condition the students to say, we don't care what you think at this point. We want to know what you can prove through the literature. It's really only through that chapter four that you can now bring up your voice because now you have done the research, now you can contribute. And I think that for me is sort of similar is that we condition our students to, to, to not share much about themselves throughout their whole beginning of their journey until really to the end. And then it's the end where we say, okay, now tell us who you are. And I'm like, well, but you told me for the last two years that I who I am is not what's important. What's important is what I'm reading and what I'm doing and so forth. So I think it's, it's a combination of, of, of those things, but, but more plainly than that, I think it's just a human um, situation, right? It's, 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 it's like um, uh, the, the biblical verse of it's easier to point out a little twig in somebody's uh, eye than the big log in your, in, in your own eye. And it's because we, are much easy, we find it much easier to point out who somebody is than mm -hmm. actually to reflect on who we are. Because I think that's really, that's deep and painful because sometimes it might mean confronting things that you don't like about yourself. You could say that you are the most liberal man in all the world. And then you're like, wait a minute, how did I, how did I do this? And, and, and a quick story of, of how that happened to me, I was I went to the university and I maybe had to do research and a colleague of mine who I who went to school together, I came up, I said, you know, I'm really confused that when I'm in all these international contexts, people are talking about how, you know, African women are oppressed. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a, a way to, to identify with that because the women in my family are out working, they're independent, they're doing all of these things. So, uh, and they can work in the office and work at home and everything else. So what is this idea coming from? And then my friend looked at me and said, well, have you ever stopped to think that the stuff that you have normalized about your mother were not supposed to be normal in the first place, right? That she was doing things that 
society forced her to do that you just accepted as normal? Have you ever stopped to think that the things that you are considering normal were actually um, gender imbalances that you never thought of? And that for me kind of shook me back. I was like, wait, I never even thought of stopping to think about that. Now I have to question my assumption. I have to question my worldview. And that's really painful, I think, for us to do. And for a novice researcher, I think that's even harder. Uh, for established researcher, that comes with time, with more research project you do and so on. Um, so I think it's, it's both the way we teach, but also I think a matter of just human, um, uh, um, the way to be human, that you, it's harder to be able to reflect on on yourself and your own experiences. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that this process of reflection should start from the very beginning of the research journey. I like think so. Why are they choosing this topic? Why yeah. is it important to them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But why, why are you here? Why are you studying this? What, what drives you uh, to do this? Um, mm -hmm. Because unless you can answer that question, um, you're not you have to be engaged in that reflective process throughout your journey and i think we have to empower students to say what you who you are matters what you say is important um and you might not have the language of research and all this stuff that we can give you as you go along but that doesn't mean that you're coming as an empty vessel you have something to contribute and you have to reflect about that foundation because you're already coming with, with a strong foundation that has been built. Yes. Which means to say that the researcher's voice should be present from chapter one, yes. chapter two, chapter three, right? Yes. And until the end. Now we have many questions here. I can believe we have 19 questions here. Uh, Dr. Totalini, we cannot answer all these questions. We will choose, uh, Pavel, you yes, will leave your project only. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can have like two questions. And then uh, Dr. Totalina, I hope it's okay with you. Our practice in the Accra community is the questions that cannot be answered. Uh, the, we ask the resource speaker to answer and then we post in our Accra FB page. Is that all right? Absolutely, I'll be happy to. Thank you. Okay, let's proceed. I'm not going to project, but uh, I was trying to, to group questions a bit, uh, if we can. Uh, there is um, a common question about uh, subjectivity um, overall. Um, uh, one question is about uh, uh, adding more researchers. Uh, does it add to an objectivity and less in subjectivity? Another, um, especially in data analysis, another uh, uh, comment here is that, um, is it safe to say that human beings will never be objective? <laughs> um, yeah, I have maybe there are more about uh, objectiv subjectivity. As humans are innately subjective, how can the research preserve, preserve objectivity as needed? So these are all the same questions to belong to the same group. Yeah. Then we have one more group question <laughs> after that. Yeah. Um, I think my honest belief is that there is nothing that is human made that's objective, right? I, I think uh, everything from the design of tools, computers and everything else, nothing that is human made is objective um, because as human beings, we exist within a culture and culture is everything. Um, uh, and, 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 and it influences the way we think, the way we speak, the words we choose. Um, everything is, in, is, is impacted in there. I think the biggest disservice that we have done in research is glorify this notion of objectivity, that objectivity is, has to look a certain way and, and so on. And, and I think that's, that's a disservice. I think we should own our subjectivity. I think maybe owning that is what leads us to a bit of more um, of, or towards objectivity. Now, the, the first question that you that you read, um, I think that's what we have done a lot in qualitative research. We say, well, if I can get other people to verify and validate and sort of triangulate all of these things, then it means that my stuff is, uh, is, is objective. But often we choose who we give these things to, right? So 
if if I create a research instrument to study educational technology in the Philippines, and I have my colleagues in Nigeria review that instrument, um, I can say, yeah, I had a lot of people look at this, but I didn't get anybody from the Philippines to actually look at this and see if it's culturally relevant, uh, if it's going to work in the context that I wanna make it. So I think sometime we take comfort in saying that we have given it to others um, and then it's okay. But I think you can do that, but that doesn't take away from you needing to know who you are, right? Because I think that knowing who you are is critically important it doesn't say once you know who you are, you'll be fine. You can still do that and give your work to other people to be able to, um, to get a different perspective. I think the more perspectives you have, the more hopefully you get towards, um, towards some sort of truth. Uh, but I don't think that should be seen as the gold standard. As long as you give it to this many people that, 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 that you're okay. Um, I, it's, I don't want to say that there's no such thing as object objective uh, truth, but I haven't found it yet. So <laughs> there might be, there might be some, but for me, it's just harder to say. Well, no, this is just one way of of, of doing it. Um, but I just, from my positionality and from what I believe uh, in the world, is that I think um, human beings don't have objective truth. Um, but that's just something that I believe. Okay, uh, Pavel, you want me to ask the last question? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, there are many good ones here, but uh, because we are running short of time, um, Dr. Totalina, I think the question is like, so what aspects of yourselves will you disclose when you are, uh, now I think we are, the questions here are more on how you state, it's now the statement because, you, you know, of my, yourself, uh, maybe just like, okay, now uh, this is who I am and how uh, who I am impacts what I am doing. But just in case you are required to state your reflexivity as part of a journal article or a thesis or a dissertation, what are what aspects of yourself should you include there? And here's one question. Does that include disclosing your philosophical stance? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, I think what you disclose is what you believe informs and influences uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, and I know that that's an abstract quite, uh, response because it really is, it's harder to give a template and say, this is the one template that you should always use for every reflective, uh, for your positionality statement in every article. I don't think there is such, I think it has to be uh, contextual. Um, if, if we go back to, I think my second or third slide where I was talking about qualitative research is contextual. Uh, and because it's contextual, contexts are going to be different from one to the next. And I think our statements have to also take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it's going to, it's hard for me to say, this is one that you should give in this context. This is the one you give in this mm -hmm. context. But I think it has to be in terms of what you're, um, what you're, uh, what you're doing your work on. If, mm -hmm. uh, let me give an, an example. Um, I'm currently doing research involving uh, Native American traditional uh, communities here in Oklahoma. Uh, and our project involves um, engaging with students on um, uh, having them learn about their culture through virtual reality so they can engage in this design because a lot of the young people are not as connected to their culture anymore. And we think that if we can maybe get them to use these emerging tools and combine them with their cultures, they might gain some interest, but also be open to STEM and so on. In that context, when I write that papers up, I need to own in my positionality that I'm not Native American, right? I need to tell people that I am an African who is working in the US. Um, I'm not from this community. 
I cannot own that indigenous knowledge that they, uh, that, that they uh, um, have a right to. And when I share that, people should be able to say, to see that, okay, um, this is how he's interpreting our ways of knowing. Uh, but if I don't uh, disclose that, that leaves the reader um, a little bit lost about how I come to that conversation. So I think it really depends on, uh, on, 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 on those type of things. So if, if I'm doing a, um, an ethnography in, 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 in a space that is not familiar to me, I have to say, this is who I am in this space. So I, I guess the, the question, the shorter answer is you should disclose who you are when you are in that space, right? So if you... Um, if I'm doing research in Namibia, I'm gonna say in this space, I'm a Namibian. I am from this group. I have been educated somewhere out in the, in the US and so forth, right? Um, and you need to know that. But if I'm doing research in the US, I don't know if it matters me saying that I am, I've been educated in the US and so forth. I should probably say, no, I am doing the research on this phenomenon, but I'm also from, from this other place. So it's really going to depend on what the research is. And, um, and, but the key is to communicate who you are in that particular context. But then that means you need to know who you are in that particular context to be able to communicate it. Mm -hmm. um, I have thought about, uh, I mean, so much in the literature talks about vulnerability of participants. What you say that disclosing who we are, making a positionality or a reflexivity statement, can you say that that is also making the researcher vulnerable? Incredibly. Uh, and that's why it's difficult to your, to your earlier question about why it's hard for novice researchers. It's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, you're, you're bearing yourself, you're bearing your soul, you're really saying this is who I am. Um, and when you do that, you open yourself up for ridicule. You open up yourself for judgment. Um, and that's, that's difficult to do. That's why it's, I think it's easier to just say, well, I ran a Cronbach Alpha on my SPSS and uh, the score said this, so I'm good, right? That's easier to do. I, I know I'm biased here, but I genuinely think that qualitative research is much more difficult because you have to be open. And you, you have to be able to say, this is who I am. And when you say, this is who I am, you open yourself up for being rejected. It's almost like when you're a high school kid, uh, a boy going to ask a girl out on a date and you are opening yourself up because she can say yes or no, and you have zero control over that response. And I think it's similar in research when you're, when you're sharing your positionality because I can, I can say who I am and, and Pavel can say, well, yeah, you don't know nothing. You don't know anything at all. And, and, and I don't think who you are should be involved in this kind of research. So mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly vulnerable mm -hmm. as a researcher but we also then have to understand that our participants are also exercising a certain level of vulnerability when they are sharing their data with us, when they are contributing to our knowledge space. Mm -hmm. um, they are being vulnerable. That's why we have to protect them through all of these uh, sort of research protocol and, and, and everything else. But, but I think it's immensely vulnerable when you have to share yourself and who you are and how you're coming to the research. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Pavel. I think uh, yeah. we have to it's end really now. So it's uh, <laughs> Dr. Totalini, thank you. Thank you so much. And I will now give the time to Dr. Graysel. Um, uh, Dr. Graysel, you're there. And while, as we wait for Dr. Graysel or David, who is going to share the certificate for Dr. Totalini, um, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our founding president, Dr. Safari Wambaleka. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Safari, for joining us. Okay, so David, who is sharing the PowerPoint? 
I think Grace will be doing it. Ah, okay. It. Yes. Sure it. Send, we are not still seeing it. Oh, how about this? Yes, this one now. Okay, yes, okay. very nice. Yes. Um, so at this point, we would like to present the certificate of recognition to Dr. Sorry, the Dr. Tuteleni um, Asino for your valuable service as our resource person today in our ACRA colloquium. Um, Virtual Colloquium number six today. Uh, congratulations and thank you very much, Dr. Tuteleni. We hope that you will continue to support ACRA in our future events. God bless you. Thank you very much.